Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast. Mark Breslin will be up in just a little bit, and uh, he is, in my opinion, the king of comedy. Uh, He has launched the careers of so many famous people uh, through his company, Yuck Yucks, which he started a long time ago. In fact, I've known him since the 80s, so he's coming up in just a little bit. Now, in case you're watching this podcast, or visual podcast, or vodcast, um, You might be on Facebook, in which case you're only going to see the listings coming up right now in the Toronto area. And in about 10 minutes, I go directly into the interview with Mark. If you want to see that, you can go to jamesb.ca and uh, just click on the podcast and you'll see it all there. Uh, You can also go to YouTube and do a little Google search. But either way, I hope uh, you'll join me and watch the whole interview. And in the meantime, here are what's in the clubs. But first, thank you to everyone who sponsors this on Patreon. Um, I am a freelance artist at the moment, uh, and uh, I really need some help. So if you can help me out, five bucks a month goes a long way. Uh, Thank you to the people who are supporting this. Some people are giving $20 a month and more. It really makes a difference. Thank you so much. Uh, Barberfinancial.ca. Captain Paul Barber has been sponsoring this from the first show. And I should tell you that barberfinancial.com or .ca, uh, that company, they're mostly busy with CPAs. What they do is they help them with uh, life and disability insurance, investments. So basically, uh, barberfinancial.com actually helps people who already know about money. Now, they also help me too, so if you're not a uh, uh, a certified public accountant, don't worry about it because he can help you too. I know nothing about finances. I mean, less than nothing. Asking me for financial advice is like asking a grade two student to explain Kepler's third law of planetary motion. It's a little bit over my head. So uh, talk to Paul. Don't talk to me. Barbarafinancial.com or .ca. Barbarian Steakhouse. Oh, now I've been talking about being away a lot. I was in LA. I was in New York. I was in Cuba. Uh, I did a whole bunch of the states in the last little while, and I love new experiences. I love new fine dining, but there's no place like home, and there's no place like Barbarian Steakhouse. I don't even eat steak, and I'm there all the time. Uh, Check it out at 7 Elm Street near Young Dundas Square. Now, before I get to Mark Breslin, here's what's in uh, happening around the town. Tonight, it's uh, Valeria Medzner. I'm why do I have such a hard time saying Valeria? Valeria Matzner and her quartet, 7.30 over at uh, Lula Lounge, 6.30 doors. You'll want to go there for dinner and you will hear bossa nova. You'll hear tango music and samba. It's beautiful music and a warm ambience. So, you know, it's winter. Feels nice to be in Lula Lounge. And uh, following that, there's some dance lessons. Marta Elena and Salsa Star perform. And then uh, DJ Suave keep you on the dance floor all night long. So that's going until like 2 in the morning. And uh, lots of other things happening at Lula Lounge, but I want to mention one more thing. Mandy Lagan is there with her band Origins. It's an amazing live tribute to Joni Mitchell. She does jazz versions. It is beautiful, uh, soft and thick jazz. And uh, the arrangements, the band and her voice, it's absolutely amazing. If you love Joni Mitchell, you got to go. And if you love Mandy Lagan, you probably already have tickets. But take my word for it, Sunday night, you're not going to find anything better. Uh, 5.30 for you who want to eat and 7 p.m. show. And all the listings for everything happening in the next while is at lula.ca. Now, HughesRoomLive.com. Let's take a look over there. I just played there last week. Still, I got to say, such a warm, cozy place. Uh, The audience pay so much attention. The staff are so happy and excited to serve you. It's just a beautiful room. Uh, So tonight, uh, celebrating International Women's Day, it's some incredible women performing. Lila Bialy, Eliana Cuevas, Miss Emily, Joni Narita, and Susie Vinnick. All of them playing there. Amazing. Uh, March 14th, Avatar and Surefire Sweat. Two incredible groups. Some of the best musicians in Toronto are playing in these bands, and it looks amazing. And next Friday, it's a week away, but you want to get your tickets now, there is a man called Rycraft presenting Sweet Baby James. Okay, that's me as a baby. Uh, What I mean is Sweet Baby James, James Taylor. That's better. James Taylor, a wonderful singer, but also an incredible performer. Well, this is the sixth annual live concert tribute to this great man. And some of the singers taking part, Arlene Bishop. Wendy Lands, Tyra Jutai, Heather Bambrick, and more. So uh, check it out, all the listings at HughesRoomLive.com.
Moving over to Jazz Bistro, there is a double whammy. Well, actually, a triple treat. Uh, three great piano players in the next week playing over there. Mark Eisenman Quartet is tonight. Mark is so uh, renowned, so respected in this town, and he's got some monster players. Uh, Neil Swainson on bass, Terry Clark on drums, and Mark Murley on sax. It's going to be amazing tonight and tomorrow night at Jazz Bistro. Next weekend, it's Steve Coven Trio. That guy is a human marvel, uh, and that's going to be one lucky piano to have these guys playing. And in between that, Bill King is on piano with a woman I don't know yet, Cornelia Luna. Anyway, if you want to see all of this stuff at the Jazz Bistro, visit jazzbistro.ca. Uh, and there's one other thing happening. It's a little bit different. It's bluegrass music with a band called Hit Pickers. My old buddy, uh, uh, Chris Quinn, a great banjo player. And I've had a thing for bluegrass since I was a kid, so it's going to be a lot of fun there. Uh, check everything out at jazzbistro.ca and then over to oldmilltoronto.com at the Homesmith Bar. Tonight, it's uh, Roy Patterson and Brian Dickinson, uh, guitar and piano, beautiful music. Next week, one of my favorite trumpet players, John McLeod, is going to be playing on Wednesday. Uh, LJ Folk on Thursday, and a week from tonight, trombonist and composer William Karn. So, lots of good stuff there. Always uh, free. $20 minimum and shows are 7.30 to 10.30 therex.ca let's move over there now they book 20 bands between now and next Friday so I'm only going to tell you a couple of them tonight it grooves so hard uh, BMC Organ Trio these guys are amazing Jeff McLeod on organ Ben Bishop on guitar Morgan Childs on drums they just came off of a Western Canadian tour so you can expect things tight tonight and uh, tomorrow afternoon Josh Grossman and the TGO Big Band uh, followed by Justin Backus in the early evening an incredible entertainer and singer and uh, then later at night Karn Davidson 9 which is William Karn there's that guy again and uh, Tara Davidson on sax they've got a great band and uh, other things coming up the whole week is great so check out uh, the rex.ca over at the Reservoir Lounge, you can't go wrong. From Tuesday to Saturday, everything is cool there. It's always great music, the ambience, the people. It's a party in the Reservoir Lounge. Uh, I brought a young girl in from uh, Germany. She was about 30. She freaked out and loved that place. It's also my dad's favorite place, and uh, I kind of live there. So check out ReservoirLounge.com. Any night you can go, but if you want to see Tyler Urema, Tuesdays and Saturdays, Bring your dancing shoes, get ready to drink. It is party music and some of the best high-level playing in town. So, uh, thereservoirlounge.com, you can't go wrong. And now, let's go to theater. Mervish.ca, where would we be without David Mervish and his crew? They make some of the greatest events in the city. The things they bring into town and the shows they mount, it's just great theater. So here's three. Uh, Jersey Boys, the musical that refuses to go away. Well, the reason it refuses to go away is because it's really good. You do not have to be a fan of Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons to enjoy the show. Now, if you are, you're really going to love the show, but you'll love it anyway. Uh, it's been running off and on forever, and it's back in town, and it is at the Ed Mervish Theater, formerly the Cannon Theater, formerly the Pantages Theater, but uh, I like the name, the Ed Mervish Theater. He deserves a theater named after him, the late, great Ed Mervish. So there you go. Uh, that's playing right now. And just down the street, Come From Away is at the Elgin. Now, I saw the opening, and then I saw the second opening after they changed it a little bit. It's been running in on Broadway. It's here, and it is one of the greatest shows you'll ever see. I've never seen so many people walk out, float out of a theater with so much joy. We live in trying times, and to see this show, it's so heartwarming, and it's so amazing. And uh, finally, I haven't seen The Last Ship yet. Uh, Sting is one of the uh, co-writers. And you know, it's kind of funny that, yes, it's that Sting, by the way, from The Police. Uh, I love The Old Police. I love Sting's solo work. I love the fact that a guy who wrote An Englishman in New York is now writing for Englishmen from Tyne and Ware, England. Tyne and Ware is an actual area. It's a metropolitan county. And I think it's cool if you were saying, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Tyne and Ware. But anyway, I'm not gonna do an English accent. I'm worse than Dick Van Dyke. Here's the thing. Uh, I have a feeling that Sting is having the time of his life. First of all, he gets to hang out in Toronto for a while. He's on every show. Uh, and also, he's writing for other people. He's been writing and pouring his heart out his whole life. And now he gets to write a musical for other voices and other characters. I love the soundtrack, but I've been traveling so much, I haven't been able to see the show. I promise to see the show, and when I do, I'm going to tailor this suit. Because I look a little bit disheveled right now, but inside I'm very sheveled. 
Is that a word? Anyway, we're going to move on. And uh, I want to thank uh, Mervish.ca for bringing such great theater to this town. Get yourself some tickets if you can. Look it up right away because I'm sure they're sold out in advance for quite a while. Um, now, Mark Breslin is coming up. He is my special guest. Again, if you are watching this on Facebook, you're probably not seeing this interview. You have to go to jamesb.ca or just search it on YouTube because it's not a podcast. It's a vodcast. It's a visual podcast. And Mark's coming up in a moment. Now, I've had lots of friends that I've had on this show. I've had uh, people I've worked with. He's both of those, but even more because he was like a career starter for me. Um, he booked my band, The Look People, when people were afraid of us. We were doing big things in Europe, playing to 20,000 people. We'd come here we couldn't get arrested but Mark saw something in this crazy band and he uh, gave me the musical direction job at the Ben Murgy show on CBC Friday night he also had me uh, and the look people do all kinds of comedy shows uh, Mark DeCarlo, uh, uh, Howie Mandel, uh, Emo Phillips so many amazing shows that I remember Jim Carrey so many uh, and then had me after the look people broke up as musical director for um, the uh, New Year's Eve comedy extravaganzas at Massey Hall so Mark and I go way back for years and years and I love this guy and uh, since the 80s I did a little bit of stand-up at Yuck Yucks and when I was there I remember everybody was just starting to launch off and leave for the US Howie Mandel uh, Jim Carrey, Harland Williams, Russell Peters, Nicky Payne. He has started the careers of some of my favorite. Mike McDonald. I, I won't keep listing them because I could be here all day. We're going to let him do the talking. Let's go right now to the great Mark Breslin, the founder of Yuck Yucks, to talk comedy and to find out more about him. Here we go. Mark Breslin, hello. Hi, James. <laughs> it's so good to see you. How long have we known each other? I think we've known each other since the dawn of time. We've known each other since, I'm going to guess, 1980. Probably. Probably back then when you were involved in the Al Waxman fan club. I actually did Yuck Yucks in 1984. There you go. Yeah. And oh, that's when I met you. Was what, I think I met you once or twice before that watching you do stand up uh -huh. in the early 80s. I'm sure that was an experience not to be believed or remembered. <laughs> Now, you have started some of the biggest careers. Uh, uh, Jim Carrey, Harlan Williams, Howie Mandel, Norm MacDonald, Mike MacDonald, so many people. When you started, did you have any idea that comedy was going to be your life? All right. So let's, let's immediately correct the idea that I was some kind of business genius that realized that this thing was going to be big. Because I swear to you, James, it never occurred to me. Um, I was desperate. I was unhappy. I was kind of suicidal, in fact. Um, I graduated with a degree in English literature from York, which means I could work for any taxi company in the world. <laughs> right. All my friends who were all really smart people, they were all going to law school, and they were all going, uh, they were getting their PhDs, and they were going to teach. Well, you had, your BA was, was with honor, so you were a smart student, but I, it wasn't going to go. I was not happy there. there. Right. That wasn't going to be my idea. But you see, James, people always say you should follow your dream, but I never followed my dream. I ran from my nightmare. <laughs> And my nightmare was a desk job. My nightmare was nine to five. My nightmare was um, a Jewish wife. Mm -hmm. You know, my nightmare was what I was brought up to do, and I didn't want to do it. So I flirted with the idea of uh, joining the diplomatic corps, and I went to Glendon College, and I took all my courses in French, and um, I barely passed because I'm not very good at languages, and I realized. There's two things I can't do to be in the diplomatic corps. One, I'm not good at language. I can't speak French very well. And two, I don't drink scotch. And if you don't drink scotch and you don't speak French, you don't really have a place there. So I had to find something. So when I started working at Harborfront the very first um, summer when they were, I was part of the first programming team. Right. You, you, were, you were directing in music and... Music and theater. And theater, right. Right. Um, I met a lot of comics. And we had a comedy night. And it was the first time we had, there was a comedy night in, in Toronto. And I ran it. And um, I met all kinds of great comics. I started doing a little comedy myself because I was introducing all the acts. And then disaster struck. Two years later, they fired all of us. And all my friends had nowhere to play. So being the entrepreneurial guy, I guess, um, and also because, like I say, I was really desperate. I, I just didn't fit in anywhere. I thought, well, maybe we could do our own night. I went to a friend of mine who was running the fingerboard. Which was Cafe. Joel Eisler? Nope. Nope. Uh, Mark Rubenstein. Okay. And uh, I used to teach his brother when I taught in a free school. 
and Mark Rubenstein was running this uh, uh, fingerboard night, and all the folkies were there, and I was friends with the folkies. I said, could I bring some comics down? We'll do folk, in, we'll do comedy in between the folkies. And he said, yeah, let's try it. And it was a disaster. Of course because it was. Because the people who <laughs> like, right? The yeah. people who like folk music are like, Earth tones and patchouli oil, and they're sweet. And they don't have a dark and sense of humor fine. usually. No, right. and the people who were, uh, you know, the comics were in the back smoking, chain smoking, and wearing black, and 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 scowling at everybody. <laughs> and then I had the best idea I ever had in my life, the simplest idea. Yeah. I thought, well, what if we could do a different night just for comedy? This had never been done before. We're talking 1976. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I went to the board of the community center and said, could I have a night? And they said, yes, but we're going to have to charge you $38 a night. And I said, ooh, that means I'm going to have to charge people. I'll charge them a dollar to get in. Hey, if I sell it out, 100 seats, I could pay the rent, give the comic something, like the head comic, the, the feature yeah. comic something, and have enough to go out after the show uh, with all my friends. That's what happened. Nine weeks passed. It was kind of, mm, people were coming. There were maybe 30, 40 people in the room. And I got a call from uh, a guy named Jack Capizza, who was the entertainment uh, editor at The Globe. And he said, listen, I hear you're doing something interesting on Wednesday nights. Do you mind if I come down? I'd like to write a little piece about it in The, in the Globe. I went, sure, come down. Mm -hmm. So he came down, I saw him writing in his notebook, and at the end he said, I think I can get something in this Saturday. I said, that'd be fantastic, Jack, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That Saturday morning I wake up, and I wake up later than most people usually, and I had one <laughs> yeah. of the first um, answering machines in the city, uh, and usually there's two or three messages waiting for me, but there were 78 messages waiting for me. I thought, oh no, who died? So I press it, and I said, Mark, go get the globe. Eh, Mark, go get the globe. Eh, Mark, you gotta go down and get the globe. Eh, Mark, you gotta see the globe. So I put on my clothes, <laughs> I ran out, I got the globe. Yeah. And there was a two-piece, two-page spread in the, in the Globe and Mail about the most radical, most interesting comedy thing ever to happen in Toronto, including Second City. Yeah. The next Wednesday, I went down an hour earlier, as I usually do, to the venue. Mm -hmm. And there was a lineup around the block. I counted 902 people waiting to get in, and it never abated from then. Wow! And then one, I mean, a big article. Yeah. But one article is what catapulted the idea. Well, it was in the days when an article could do that. Right. Because right. we didn't have a million other distractions. That's the right. paper was the paper. The paper yeah. was the paper. Yeah. Wow! And then at some point, you went from the Church Street Community Center basement. To Yorkville, to Yuck Yucks. And that's sort of a story in itself because I, um, I had a friend from high school who, who was a business whiz and came from a very wealthy business family and he was studying business in Stanford. And he came in for the summer and called me up and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing this uh, comedy show uh, once a week. He said, okay, uh, I'll come. So I took him down and he watched the show and I said, what'd you think? He said, well, the show wasn't really, you know, for me particularly, but you have a business here. I said, I do? He said, yeah. He said, let me raise some money for you. Let's find a, a, a space. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be doing this six night a, nights a week in your own space. And he helped very much there. His name was Louis Feinberg. Wow. So he didn't get the comedy, but he saw what was yeah. right in front of him. Yeah. yeah, he was a really straight guy. Yeah. Uh, all the way, even through high school. He was the kind of guy who would read the Wall Street Journal um, in the school cafeteria right. in, uh, during lunch. Right. So he was that kind of guy. Um, I've lost touch with him. He lives in New York. He's an arbitrator, I believe, on Wall Street. And then there was Joel Axler, who was really important at that time, too, because Joel was my, I just, I was just with him, actually, mm -hmm. today. Um, Joel was my best friend and the guy who was the soul of the comedy. If something made Joel laugh, then I knew it was the right kind of laughter. He was the person I right. bounced everything off. Yeah. Um, I got a few of those in my life, too. I get it. Right? You, he's really your watermark. He's, yeah. gonna, he's your audience. And Paul yeah. Mandel was another one. Not Howie Mandel, Paul Mandel, mm -hmm. who was a kind of Lenny Bruce figure in Toronto in the 70s. They're also a very important person in the whole evolution of Yuck Yucks. Yeah. And so you moved in, and I mean, at some point, that, that black box of a club in Yorkville was the epitome of what a comedy club always still is today. When you try to go huge, 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 
it never feels the same as that. There's a sweet spot for comedy clubs. There's a lot of places now that do comedy. I call it pub comedy. There's 30 seats. There's 40 seats. There's 50 seats. It's not enough. Right. You don't have enough separation between the performer and the audience to create the stagecraft that you need to be able to perform comedy. Right. And if it's too big, then it just becomes a concert venue and you lose all intimacy. Plus, if, you're, if your place is too small, it's hard to make any money. So what do you think, 100, 200? What's, what's your 200 sweet spot? 200 is the sweet spot. We yeah. just opened up a club in Burlington last week, 170 seats. Yeah. And that's fine. Yep. Yeah. That's, but that's one of the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. Usually they're more. The Toronto Club has 300. The Vancouver Club has 300. The Calgary Club has 320. Niagara uh, Falls? Has 350. Yeah. Yeah, these, these are the kinds of... So you, you want to go much... 14 yuck yucks. Yes. But they're like oil wells. They gush. And then they trickle. Yeah. And then they close. And then they gush. Uh, another one gushes and another one trickles. And, um, the important thing is to keep digging. Right. Because then you just keep keep it at that number or more. Right. And and things do come and go and people change their mind and they go, I just want to have a chicken restaurant or something. That's right. People just change their minds anyway. Yeah, unless you're in a big, big city. Yeah. In which case there's always, you know, room for yeah. uh, for a comedy club. But um, it's... Uh, they they come and go, and yeah, even now, after 42 years in the business, it's not like I can kind of sit back and, and collect, collect right. my money. It you still got to work. I still have to work. And figure out which comedian works in which market and try nope. to put them on a tour? No, nope. nope. actually, uh, here's, what, here's what I find, not to contradict you, James, yeah. but um, geography does not play a major part in the appreciation of comics, um, because, but class, uh, money... Uh, education does and when you have a comedy club it sort of segments the audience towards a certain kind of person who's going to go there they're going to have some education they're going to have be sort of between 25 and 45 years of age they're going to be about equally distributed male and female um, they're going to have some um, they're probably going to have uh, you know what it's go you're going to get a guy who's a bank teller but not the bank president. Right. Yep. That's kind of Somebody the, with a decent job, but who also is smart enough to get the jokes and, yes, and want to be there in the first right. place. That's right. So whether we're in Calgary or whether we're in Edmonton or whether we're in Toronto or Halifax doesn't really mean much because if you close your eyes and you open them and you look at the audience, you wouldn't really know where you were because right. it's, it's all segmented to a certain kind of... Of, of person who wants that experience. Right so is it the, I mean, I would think there's no other club that has that many. I've seen a long time ago, I saw the world's largest chain of comedy clubs. Unless there's something happening in China that I don't know about, which I doubt, I don't think there is anything that has more than two or three of any not in, Not in Canada, but in the uh, States, the improvs, I think, have the 19. Oh, okay. So they're, the, they're really number one. However, it's all how you, how you analyze it because they don't, have a, uh, they don't have an agency that sets up satellite rooms, and we do. And right. if you add our satellite rooms, which of which there are at least 40, yeah. Well, then I guess we are the biggest. Right. Amazing. Now, when you were starting and you had people like Jim Carrey and Harlan Williams, that's exactly when I was there, was watching them. And did you know that they were going to be going huge? Or were you like, these guys are good, glad I got them? Did you? Neither, because we didn't even think of what stardom was. The person who changed the game first was Mandel, was Howie Mandel. Mm -hmm. Howie Mandel was a crazy crazy guy on stage who would do anything for a laugh and we all thought he was fantastic but nobody ever said yeah so he's obviously going to be a television star or a movie star but then he went to California really fast yeah well, that would have been about 1979 1980 he got that uh, Dr. Fiscus part in what was it remember the St. Elsewhere, Saint Elsewhere. Yeah, in right. Saint Elsewhere. Yep. and he became a star and that completely changed the game and the expectation of what people ex uh, expected no comics thought they were going to do anything but you know, go to Belleville and get a hundred bucks. That was <laughs> right. wow. I mean, I get to stay in a uh, in a hotel and there's and get like, paid and there's hookers uh, in <laughs> in the hotel and I can drink milk out of the carton. Wow, that's fantastic. So they didn't expect much. And then Jim Carrey went a year later and did the same thing, um, and that all changed the game. But in the very beginning, nobody thought about being a star, James. Right. They just thought, wow. I don't have to work at Starbucks. <laughs> that was exactly. all. That, that's the bar was very low. Yeah, uh, with the thought of the late great Mike McDonald. Mm. 
that that guy had a sense of style that is so Canadian he would say things that are that is so heartwarming and funny how would you describe his sense of humor or his, his style to someone who hadn't seen him well you also have to remember that Mike went through different iterations of his personality when he first started um, he was doing four hours uh, on stage a night and he would do a different four hours every night um, it was just like a Roman candle going off and it was all about um, his dis his distrust of authority and authority figures which centered on his parents especially his father there was a lot of Freudian stuff in Mike's act if you even if you didn't look very hard yeah. and he built a tremendous audience because of that but remember also the other thing that Mike did was he was very cartoon like in the way he would do his comedy so he wouldn't just say a joke he'd act out the joke yeah which made it very very powerful yeah um, after a while Mike's stuff got more refined uh, and less uh, less physical um, and especially after he you know had his liver transplant and nobody even expected him to go on stage ever again liver transplants are a very hard thing to come back from yeah um, and and he did and for a good five years he was out there but he wasn't jumping around he was he couldn't jump around right. but he was he was he was more like a, a f uh, somebody who would fence uh, than somebody who would use an axe right now when you're watching young comedians how much advice do you give them or how much do you watch like you, I know you really mentor people and give them feedback that's how they get good how do, how do you do that what's the process well I, I watch them and sometimes I say nothing and they get very upset but just because I say nothing doesn't mean that I didn't like them it means I just don't have anything to say keep doing what you're doing but sometimes people they're too fast it's so simple I just tell them to slow down or sometimes they're too slow and I tell them to speed up mm -hmm. and sometimes some of the jokes they do don't go with the other jokes they do you can't for instance um, come on like you're a big stud and tell a bunch, bunch of jokes about being a big stud and then talk about what a loser you are like you're one or the other keep the character consistent because all comedy starts with character that's right. why Jack Benny can be so funny just by going like that that's why Jeremy Hotz can be funny by just going, uh, by screwing up his face. Yeah. Because people immediately get the shorthand of the character. And that's the most important single thing you can do. Interesting. Now, you did a whole bunch of TV as a consultant on many things, the Joan Rivers show. Well, I actually executive produced that well, show. Well, that's funny because you, that was actually on Fox. So technically, you produced for Fox. Fox wasn't Fox then. Exactly. Fox, you know, I was on the ground floor of Fox. That was the first show that they ever did. Um, they had just put the network together with a, st with a string of stations that were unaffiliated. And they had big money behind them. And Barry Diller was, you know, from originally from Paramount, was, was running the show. And uh, it could have gone in so many different ways. At that time, Fox was really exciting. Fox did not have Rupert Murdoch behind it, remember? Fox had no particular politics. All Fox wanted to do, actually, was do a more uncensored version of what the other networks were doing. I feel I kind of screwed myself over because when Joan's job ended, I didn't go to them and say, you need a comedy person here. Um, and I could have been on the ground floor of something very exciting before Fox became the you know right-wing fascist mouthpiece that it is right. but that happened at least 10 years later right and so when you worked with Joan what would what would be a memory of that where you realize hey like you're in New York doing this right no oh, LA oh you're in LA yeah so you're in you're now in LA I'm in you're LA you're still running yuck yucks while you're doing this I'm in LA um, with a Rolls Royce that I had bought um, going to um, every party imaginable as Jones representative um, and uh, you know there wasn't a sh there wasn't a restaurant I couldn't get into there wasn't a concert I couldn't get into meanwhile running my uh, my mini empire mm -hmm. from there uh, with a, an office that uh, had picture windows that overlooked the Hollywood sign and Bruce Bell um, who was my Toronto very good historian friend. that's Toronto historian who was my my very good friend then and, and, and my assistant I brought him down and Fox was so good I said they, the people of Fox came to me and said listen you're working really hard is there anything we can do for you I said you know want to know the truth I feel like my my company in Canada is getting neglected and I 
I feel like I'm torn. I said, well, what would make it better? I said, well, if I could bring my assistant down here. They said, fine, bring him down here. And I brought him down. He had an office next to mine. He did all the yuck yuck stuff. Um, and he would just come in and say, what do I do here? What do I do there? And, and uh, they even gave me money to get him a wardrobe. Wow. And he dresses fabulously, and by the way. He dresses fabulously. <laughs> they, got, they got him a car. This is the thing about the United States uh, versus Canada. There, if you're in in the U.S., money is just no object. Whatever you want. Do you know I had when I was running um, that that show for Fox? I had an assistant who was responsible for getting coffee, and I had a separate assistant for somebody who was getting tea. Okay. <laughs> Contrast that when I ran the Ralph Ben Murphy show oh, for CBC, for CBC, where they would sneer at me because I wore socks that matched. <laughs> to live like that, honestly, who does this guy uh, think he is? I, I want to go there. So that show, uh, that was it, Ralph, Ralph had a first season. There was word that the, the critics never liked stuff on CBC anyway. So so they were they were harsh with the first season. Somehow. Everyone thought the show was canceled, was never coming back. And somehow the news came that you were now producing the second season of that show. Right. And the way that worked was because of Joan. I had come back from the, from the Joan show. There wasn't that much of an inter interregnum. Yeah. A couple of years. Um, the first show, the first season didn't really work. More not, not so much because of Rob, but because nobody at the CBC wanted it to work. Um, it was too glitzy. Um, and show busy for the rank and file people at CBC to want it to work. So they did everything they could to badmouth it, and they were going to cancel it. And then George Anthony said, "Wait a minute, you know Mark Breslin had a really good uh, experience down in, at Five. Why don't we try to see if he can save it?" But then now that I think about it, maybe I was just brought, brought in to give it a Viking funeral. I, uh, you know, <laughs> burn it, push it out to sea. <laughs> And you know, James, you were on the show. You were my first hire. Yeah. Uh, because, and everybody said, why don't you keep the worthy mm -hmm. multicultural band? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I want to do something surreal and eccentric because to be Canadian is to be surreal and eccentric. And I think that the Look People would be the perfect band for that. And it also extended to everything else we did. I mean, that backdrop with the, you know, the, what were they? The amazing comedians that you had on yeah. that show, it was not regular, it was, there was edge to that show. Yeah, it was, was like a, a Saturday Night Live And that's what skits. I was trying to push it towards. And I even hired people who had worked on Saturday Night Live, like Neil Levy. But um, it just collapsed under the weight of its own budget, I think, in the end. And people at the CBC kept saying, well, with all this money, do you know how many, how many shows we could make about fishermen in... in Cape Breton Island, don't you understand? Yeah. And so I think that's why. It and then they and it also making... fell apart because mm -hmm. um, Yvonne Fitzon decamped for CTV. Right. I think Yvonne, if Yvonne Fitzon had stayed at CBC, I think we would at least have gotten another season out of it. Yeah, you're right. When there's a new person, they always say, hey, why don't we do new things? That's right. That's the, that's the nature of the beast. What about all of the TV specials? And I would could never count them all. I Probably I need two hands and toes. The amount of TV specials you did for comedy for all different networks, do you have a favorite? Yes. My favorite was called Mondo Taboo. Mondo Taboo was done for, a, I think, a station that doesn't even exist anymore. I, I can't even remember what the station was, but it was a, a, one of the first cable stations. And because it was cable, it was relatively uncensored. And what I did was I not only put the most um, edgy comics on those shows, we shot it on film, which made it really different. I gave it a very different look, and we had topless waitresses. <laughs> and when we had the topless waitresses, I said to the director, do not linger on them. Make it as if this is just the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, it's a comedy club. They have topless waitresses, and the waitresses would just happen to go by in the shot as if it didn't matter. That's what made it funny to me. Right. If you lingered on it, then it would have been Benny Hill. Right. But the idea that we live, we were living in a kind of bizarro universe where sex was just something to shrug at and no big deal at all and completely acceptable. And yeah, completely she's blocking my view of the comedian. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> right. Get your get your breasts out of the way, please. I'm trying to watch the... I remember um, the Jim Carrey special that you did. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of comedians involved at the John Bassett Theater. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was actually... A lot. I know. I guess Harlan Williams, maybe Jeremy Hotz, but the whole bill was so strong. Did you ever have a nightmare 
like a show that you could not work with the crew or something was falling apart? Um, we did um, a special in Calgary, and it just wasn't very well organized. And the late Joe Bodelai was producing it, and I think he had a lot of personal problems even then. And when I got out there, there was really no set. There was really, it was poor, there was no script. It was, it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, who hosted that one? The guy from Kids in the Hall, um, Kevin McDonald. And um, he didn't do very well. It was, it was just terrible all the way around. That was the worst show we ever did. The best show we ever did probably was the one actually in, at the um, National Arts Center, the 25th anniversary special, yep. where there was a beautiful right. backdrop and uh, it was... And first for Canada, class. that was a real budget. Yeah, it was, a, it was first class all the way yeah. and it was a great show. I also have a memory of Carl LaBeouf uh, eating magic mushrooms and pretending he's a dinosaur at the mm -hmm. Royal York. Well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> That's what the Royal York is for. Um, and you know, Carl LaBeouf right now ha is, has a residency uh, in Vegas to do a mid. He does a midnight show, I think, every Friday night, um, uh, which is a kind of uh, edgy, uncensored show in one of the big showrooms, and it's a huge hit. Wow, that's yeah. good news. So he's fallen like on his feet. Do you have a few other favorites? I mean, I, I met so many comedians for the first time at Yuck Yucks over all these years. Mike Wilmot was taking off like crazy doing the, some movies and things. Right. Do you have any favorite that like, you're really proud of that they're, they're hitting it out of the park right now? Well, I'm, I'm proud of everybody who does well, obviously. Um, but, you know, whether it's Nikki Payne or it's Aaron Berg or, you know, even some of the Americans. When I brought in... Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld was not Jerry Seinfeld with a capital J, capital S. Mm -hmm. He was just a really good comic out of New York who was grateful for the gig. And but I saw something big in him, and I was certainly right. You know, I ran into him. We uh, do a, a charity event called Humor Me every year. Uh, David Goodman yeah. runs it uh, at the Elgin Theater, and we raise about two million dollars a year for. Um, at-risk youth. Wow, I didn't know the money was that big. Yeah, wow. it's good. Um, it's good. Well, we deal with a lot of millionaires, mm -hmm. and it's a thousand dollars a seat. Anyway, we usually have a, a headliner, and Seinfeld was a headliner a couple of years ago, and we were musing. Jerry told me he's worth eight hundred and eighty million dollars, and sometime in the next five years, he was going to cross the billion-dollar threshold. Wow! And we were laughing because. I think I paid him 1200 bucks for the week when I had him. Um, Kinnison was another story, too. I mean, when I discovered Kinnison to bring in, the people at the comedy store were, were shocked that I would bring in this guy. See, what ha used to happen was, I, I always prefer to hire Canadians first. But in the old days, there just weren't that many Canadian headliners, so I would have to go to New York, go to Los Angeles, and find people. There was no internet then, right? Right, and you didn't want to depend on the words of an agent because they just want to sell things. So I would go down myself. So I went down to uh, the comedy store. This would have been about eighty-three, maybe eighty-two, and uh, they would put on their inventory. They put on twelve or fourteen acts for me to watch, and I would pick one or two and say, "Those are the guys. Let's bring them up to Canada." So I did that one. One day, one night. And Kinnison was a wild man at this point. Why well, he always was, but he was and wild. And Kinnison wasn't on the bill. They did 12 acts, and then they said, okay, it's over now. We're going to just put on a guy. He clears the house so we can give everybody their bill and get him on. If you want to leave now, we can talk in the office if we want. I said, I'm not going to walk out on the guy. It's What's it going to be, another 10, 12 minutes? I'll stay. And I fall in love with this crazy man who breaks, the first thing he does, he breaks a chair, then he screams uh, about, his, about his marriage, and, and I, it was fantastic. So then the people from the comedy store come to me and they say, okay, so who did you like? I said, well, I really liked the last guy. And they said, yeah, uh, Sam Schutz, he was fanta he's fantastic. His bit on airplane food is fantastic. And I went, no, 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 no. Not that guy, the real last guy. And they went, you want to hire Sam Kinison? Are you kidding me? I went, yeah, I do. Which I did. But it was before Sam had put his act together exactly. So when he came in four months later, he starts on a Wednesday, goes to the Sunday. That's the normal yeah. range for the, for the comic to do. Uh, on the Wednesday, he wasn't very good. I came down on the Thursday, and he was so bad. There were about a hundred people in the room. He actually walked the entire audience. I don't mean most of the audience. Right. No I one's mean left. Every single person. 
Show's over. I go backstage. Norm MacDonald tells this story, by the way. This is Norm MacDonald's favorite story about me. Yeah. Um, and one of his favorite showbiz stories. I go backstage and I pull a hundred dollars out of my wallet and Sam probably thinks, oh great, he's gonna give me my hundred bucks and I'm, I'm fired, I have to go, and he's gonna send me home. And I go, Sam, this is a bonus for you tonight. This is a bonus because you walked the entire audience and I'm giving you an extra hundred dollars for that magnificent achievement. And I will give you another hundred dollar bonus every night for the rest of the week when you walk the audience, if you walk the audience again. But you have to walk the entire audience or you don't get the extra bonus. <laughs> I gave him the hundred bucks, and as I walked out, he was just stupefied. As it happens, he didn't walk the rest of the audience the other nights, but he didn't do particularly well either. It was just, you know, when somebody's doing something really new in art, it's really ugly until it gets perfect, and then it's considered to be a major uh, advance forward and a major breakthrough. The next time I brought him in, which was maybe eight months later, there were no walk-ins. The next time I brought him in, maybe eight months after that, standing ovations. And I was friends, because of that thing, I was friends with him for the rest of his life. When he died at a very large concert, there was at least a thousand people in the room, uh, about John Bassett Theatre, you had everyone scream instead of a moment of silence. That's right. That's the way he would have wanted that's it. That's right. I loved Sam. Sam was more fun than anybody. It's very interesting to think what Sam would have done with this whole Me Too um, conservative um, uh, kind of movement that's happening now between men and women. When he came to the club, he would organize orgies for the staff. <laughs> all my waitresses, bang, bang, bang. They were all fucking them. <laughs> that's hilarious. All right. Um, it was consensual. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, well, Emo Phillips, you must have a story about Emo Phillips. Emo, what you know, Emo gave uh, when I got married recently. Not that recently, it was almost ten years ago. But when I got married in California, Emo was the guy who did the toast for the bride for the bride and groom, and he got up there. Uh, it was in Laguna Beach. It was beautiful, and he said, "May your now that you are married, may your couplings." No longer offend the Lord. <laughs> Emo is the best joke writer out there. Always was, always will be. Um, very, very smart, very well-read guy. But not that different off stage than on stage. Um, he lived with us in Palm Springs when my, he lived with my wife and I in Palm Springs when we lived there for a while for a month uh, and we invited him to come live with us and he's not that different right. he's uh, people think he just stopped the voice when he gets off stage no. no that is his voice but it always makes me wonder I mean what about Bob Dylan does he finish up the show go back to the hotel room and go well I'm glad that's all I don't have to talk like that anymore <laughs> I mean I've always wondered that <laughs> exactly now you've written a bunch of books um, Son of a Meech yes uh, Brian Mulroney. Which got me in vast trouble. The, ne the publisher, I guess it was HarperCollins, uh, or was it Random House? I can't remember. One of the two. Um, I was on tour across the country to promote it. They stopped the tour halfway through and said, get back home. Everyone is upset about this book in the government, and we are getting tremendous blowback on it. And I said, I refuse. I'm going out on my own dime, and yep. I'm promoting the book. Yep. And I'm telling them that you did that and needless to say they never did another book with me. Right. So that was definitely Harper Collins because you ended up with Random House on Control Freaked, which made me laugh my ass off. Thank you. Ran, uh, Control Freaked I think is the best thing I've ever written. Um, and the most honest thing and there's I think there's a good joke on every page. Yep. Um, it's a what I'll call a creative autobiography. It doesn't start with the beginning and then go to the end. It's more organized along themes. Each chapter is a theme that's important in my life. Uh, you know, girls, uh, politics, sex, uh, my body, um, you know, uh, my business, all these different things. And each one is a, is a simple, discrete chapter. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud of the book. I'm still proud of the book. Um, it actually did hit the bestseller uh, list for a little while. M but you were wrong about uh, random. It's not random. It's in a small press. It's called Insomniac. 
Oh, really? It's Insomniac Press. They're I out released, of London. I released my book of poetry on Insomniac last year, and they're great to work they're with. They're out of London, Ontario yeah, now, right? Great, yeah, great to work with. I didn't know it was Insomniac. That's mm -hmm. so cool. So you wrote four books, and then you kind of also have done all kinds of radio, whether it's XM Satellite, whether it's Q107. I mean, so many different radio. You know radio the wonderful places. thing about um, my life has been that... Uh, I'm certainly not doing the same job every day because if I did it for 42 years, I don't think I'd be able to do it for 42 years. So because I'm interested and I have expertise in a genre rather than in a, a particular medium, um, that genre has gotten me work in live performance, um, television, film, education, literature. It's right. cut across everything. Exactly. Radio. And when you say film, I actually forgot Confessions of a Porn Addict. Oh, you have a yeah. cameo in that movie. Gotta, gotta thank Spencer Rice for that. Yeah. He and gave me a great role. And Kenny vs. Spenny. Yes, speaking of that. that. And Robocop, the TV series. So a whole bunch of little, like, hey, I think that was, stop that. I think that was Mark Breslin. Yeah, well, I do these zealot moments. I would do more <laughs> right. of them, except people don't really call. And I'm not going to go out on auditions. I just don't right. have the time right. uh, to do that. But if somebody wants me, I'm there. There and I'll do my best job. I love it. So don't what like is, learning lines either. Frankly. What's that? I don't like learning lines. Right, right. It should be either a cameo or something you can riff. Yeah. Don't play against your type. You don't need to be a Klingon. No. Too much makeup. Thank you. Um, what is something in the future you're looking forward to in, in the next little while? Is there something? Is there a an idea on your plate? Whether it's film or a concert or something new? I've always got new things going. I've got two screenplays out there, both of which are kind of autobiographical and actually spring from Control Freaked. Um, and they've both been optioned by legitimate producers, but we'll wait and see what happens. I mean, films don't really get made in this country very much. We That's don't right. really have a film culture. We have a bit of a TV culture, but we don't really have a film culture. So options mean at least you have Somebody some money and someone to run with it, and now you can That's move right. on and see what happens. That's right. Yeah. Somebody put some money in my pocket and said, yes, this is a worthwhile uh, project to to get involved in. I got to ask you this: yeah. uh, in Control Freak, you mentioned one of the funniest things, and it's very early on. Uh, women, when they're beautiful, you can tell they're beautiful. Their curves show. Uh, they can wear low cleavage. With men, you really don't know what they're packing. And in one part, you said maybe it would be fair if men could actually expose their penis if that's their best asset, if that's their something that, that's beautiful. I really must send that to Louis C.K. <laughs> um, I really should do him the privilege of, of sending him that, that part. What I was trying to say in that piece was, well, you know, I mean, I'm a little guy. Um, I, I, I was never the guy who would walk into a room and all the women would turn around and go, ooh, who's that guy? I want to go home with him. But give me a chance to open up my mouth. Give me a chance to talk to you. Give me a chance, and, and if you only knew I wasn't built in proportion, um, you know, and then you might be interested in. But by the time they realize that, it's too late. I've already done. I've already gotten the job. So it just feels. I just feel like I'm. 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 Uh, not getting what I, I. I'm not getting what I should. I never got what I should yeah. because if. If men's pants were cut in such a way that there were two legs, and then there was the third leg that you you know insert, yeah. and you could see how long it was, right. well then maybe I'd have a chance. <laughs> now you were a confirmed bachelor for so many years. How did your wife hook you, other than being amazing in every way? But what what was that like? Well, um, I think it was a war of attrition uh, that she won. I, I would <laughs> like to think of it in that way. Um, I uh, I was perfectly happy going to movies. Um, doing my business, um, having nice relationships with girls that I knew. Um, I always believed, you know how they talk about how um, people should leave a, a small carbon footprint? And I always believed you should leave a small emotional footprint. Um, I never understood the obsessive intimacy that people always want to impose on you. And it's certainly if you go into therapy, that's the first thing they want is, you know, they want you to be intimate with, with the people around you. And, well, maybe that intimacy is just not your thing. Maybe there's a lot of different ways of being intimate. Maybe what's really intimate is, is exposing yourself uh, to people and telling them how you really feel and all those things, which I've always done, always believed in. And then saying, okay, well, I got to go because uh, I have another date. <laughs> You know, and, and that's that was good enough for me. Yeah. Um, I was an obsessive dater, and um, 
was involved with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women all across the country. I, I had uh, girlfriends stashed like uh, alcoholics stash liquor bottles in their yeah. in their apartments, and I had you know a girlfriend in Calgary, and a girlfriend in Vancouver, and it really made me want to travel. So it was all a lot of fun, and I was perfectly happy doing that, and I would have done that for the rest of my life as long as people would have been women would have been interested. Yeah. Um, but I'm also extremely happy being married and having a child. Um, so maybe I'm just a happy person. It's just possible that you know I enjoy my life no matter what direction it goes in. Yeah. Because I'm not in Auschwitz, you know. And well, you never thought that you were going to have a kid. When I knew you were back in the day, that was not on the list. And then I see how cool your kid is. He's great. I love my child, um, which I never thought I would say. And I would never thought I would say this. My child gives me less. Do you know the word surus? Does that word mean anything to you? Surus. Surus. It's a Yiddish word that means troubles. Right. So I never thought my child would give me less surus than anything else in my life. I thought it would be the Tsuris, right. but it's not. Right. I love every minute. In fact, after this podcast, I can't wait to go home and spend the evening with my little boy, mm -hmm. watching TV with him, finding out about his day. He's a really great, delicate child, um, like his daddy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I uh, he doesn't like sports, which is great for me. Oh, I can't imagine you having to drive him to hockey practice. No, it's he, like, tell me some jokes instead. No, Stay home. his attitude is only stupid people like hockey, which he <laughs> says really loudly sometimes when we go for wings in a sports bar. And, uh, <laughs> it's very dangerous for him to say that. So I put him in tennis class because everybody has to do something physical, mm -hmm. and I can't get him to go. I can't get him to go. And I said, Jackson, what is the problem with tennis class? He goes, oh, Daddy, tennis is so rough. Oh my word! So rough. So, so football's out of the question. So football's <laughs> out of the question. So this is this is the right child for me. I right. think. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not. Um, you'd think, oh well, he's he wants to be in show business or that. He has no interest in acting whatsoever. Uh, he likes a show called The Odd Squad. It's a, like a, I don't know if you know the show. Um, it's made in Canada, but it's a hit all over the world, and it's like kids who are secret agents, basically. So it's shot here, and a friend of mine, Warren Sonoda, is the um, is the director. So I called him. I said, "Can I bring my son down to the set so he can see how it, how it's put together?" He said, "Sure." So I take him down to the set with my wife, and he watches how the actors rehearse and put it together. Then they do the shots, and then they do it from the other angle. And I say, "Jackson, would that interest you to do that?" He goes, "No." So you never push a child into something like that unless they push you into it. Right. And I'm perfectly happy about that. He. He's, right now, he says he wants to be a veterinarian. He loves animals and especially under sea life. And um, you know, he goes to the Waldorf School, which is very much nature oriented mm -hmm. um, here in Toronto. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's he's just fantastic. So we so we named him Jackson, um, really after Jackson Pollock, because Jackson Pollock changed the world in a really big way. Um, he was one of the first to suggest that life was uh, a struggle between order and chaos in his paintings. And, uh, you know, I hope that my son does something equivalently radical and revolutionary in his own way. And also, I named him after Jackson Pollock, because I don't know if you know this, James, but there is a tradition in Judaism where you name your firstborn son after an alcoholic womanizer. <laughs> and it was very important to me that we keep that tradition alive. I didn't know that. Yes. That's brand new. You have written many book reviews um, for many people, but you've also done many film reviews, and in particular, your love of movies is almost as famous as your love of comedy. Every time your name comes up, somebody says, oh, if you want to know about a movie, like, check with you first. What is it with your love of Hollywood, or, I mean, of, and foreign films, not Hollywood, of, of the film genre? I just like sitting in the dark with strangers, James. That's what it is. They can't see me, I can't see them. Who knows what's under that popcorn How many box. movies do you go to in a year? Well, less now that I have a child, and I'm looking after my child, but before Jackson was born, I would see 300 movies 
a year out in the theater. So that doesn't count what I would watch on TV. Yeah. Now it's probably down to about 150. But that's still a huge, more than anyone, unless you are actually paid to review movies every day. And I was paid to, re uh, to review movies for uh, Metro. Yeah. Um, and that lasted for a while, and then they changed editors, unfortunately, so I didn't get to do it anymore. But I am writing for uh, Jim Slotek's Original Sin column, and I do a column with Tom Ernst, yeah. um, who I love. And yeah. um, ooh, I think we do a funny job on that. Well, I think people need to read your reviews wherever they are. What's, what's a movie you've seen in the last while that people need to see, mm. whether it's famous or not? Something, mm. either, something that blew you away you in the last really few months. You really put me on the spot yeah. there. I, you know, I have to say that the Oscars are coming up, and I have never been so uninvested in the evening because there w I, I, I make a top ten list every year. And, you know, it's a pretty thin list. Like, I guess... I'm rooting for Green Book, but it's such an unambitious movie because ultimately it's trying to convince you of stuff that you already knew back in 1965. You know, those issues had been dealt with already. Right. So um, it's, not, it's not very ambitious, but it's pl at least it's re really pleasurable and the acting's great. I watched Roma. I didn't react much to it at all. Right. So are you doing parties for... Oscars. I know once or twice in the last ten years you've actually emceed uh, an event. Do you? Do you? No, still do that? we're just doing it at home. We're just sitting at yeah. home, uh, the three of us, with a big bowl of popcorn. Yeah, just watching. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I love the fact that we got some stories, and I'll never forget the Sam Kinison story. That is a really it's amazing a good story way to deal with that. It's a good story. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank Yay. you, James. Oh, I should ask one more thing. Sure. I probably won't insert this. Okay. Um, but somebody will, will ask me why I didn't ask this. Do you remember how we met? Do you remember any of the early days? There was a reason we met, but I'm not sure what it was. I opened, Somebody. I opened a club. It was Joanne Smale who introduced us. I was. I opened a club. We had met briefly a few times over the years, and, I, and I'd done stand-up at your club once or twice, but we met... I don't remember that, by No, way. no, you weren't in the room. You weren't okay. even in the city at that... Like, you were in probably maybe in L.A. at that time. Okay. Uh, uh, that would have been uh, uh, early... or mid-80s. Mid um, but Joanne Smale uh, wrote who, to me... Who we both dearly love, correct? An amazing woman, an amazing publicist, and she read an article in the Star that said, I have this new comedy club and the new king of comedies in town. And I was mortified because that's not true and I never said that. I had comedy one out of seven nights in my club. And What was the club called? The Beehive. Right. On Queen Street. Right, uh, I remember. Queen West. And, and the... Uh, the newspaper had you sitting on a toilet looking sad, but it was your picture. It, you actually meant that picture. That was my eight by 10. Well, me on the toilet um, with a whole bunch of cigarettes um, as if I'd been sitting there constipated. It was, it was a joke about the creative process, right. ultimately. And, and they use it as if you're sad and then I'm standing above in a bigger photo smiling. So I wrote to you when Joanne said, uh, uh, you should talk to Mark and let him know that, that that's not your plan because because he does a lot of work and he's a great guy. And I said, listen, I met him once or twice. I said, I'm happy to call him. So I called you immediately and said, hey, that dude who wrote that article has it in for you. I'm not having a comedy club. In fact, if you ever want to recommend people or hang out, just come down, drinks around the house. I did all this. So we met. And in no time, we were doing the People's Comedy Festival together. Right. You uh, had me come in this in, as, as a consultant. But it was because of an article, someone in the media was I don't just remember out that, to get I don't you. remember yeah. that story, but yeah. I can tell you one thing. When you said somebody had, well, had it out for me in the media, it wasn't the first and it wasn't the last. <laughs> right. You also gave me advice way back then, because you were a fan of the Look People, my band, Big and fan. you said, save your receipts. One day they're coming after you. And they did, and I got out of being in trouble because I kept my receipts. Good. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mark Breslin. Wasn't that something? I love that guy. Well, listen, next week, another guy I'm a big fan of. I went down to L.A., and I interviewed a German who's been living there since the 80s named Sven Kirsten. He is the god of tiki culture. He has done more for tiki culture, exotica music, and that whole vibe than anyone on earth that I've ever heard of. His books, uh, published by Toshin, you know, those beautiful books. Well, 
he's got three of them out and most people I know own the first one uh, but there's three of them out there and he was also directing videos for Tom Waits and he's got all kinds of stories but when I think of what he has done for tiki culture around the world for decades he's my hero he even lives up on the hill with a giant tiki head in his front yard about 10 feet tall he's a fascinating down-to-earth guy and I look forward to talking to him next week so uh, join me next week and please if you'd like to support the James B podcast please go to patreon five bucks a month or whatever you can do is greatly appreciated here thanks to Jason J Brown who helps me put all this stuff together and we will see you next Friday on the James B podcast <laughs>